So the Sunday school teacher was walking around the class observing as they were drawing, and one little girl was so intent in what she was drawing that the teacher didn't recognize what it was, and the teacher said, uh, honey, what are you drawing? She said, I'm drawing God. The teacher said, well, God's invisible. Nobody knows what he looks like. She said, well, they will in a minute. <laughs> <clears throat> We're talking about seeing Jesus as he saw himself. Jesus knew who he was, and he reveals the Father to us. If we're ever going to see the Father, we're going to have to see the Son, because the Son shows us the Father. So we want to look at this topic of seeing Jesus as Jesus saw himself. And Jesus saw himself as, I call it, the shepherd door. He first calls himself, I am the door, in John chapter 10. He does this two times. He says, I am the door, I am the door. Right after this, he says, I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. And these two go together. I am the door and I am the shepherd. We have to put this into context, so let's give a little background. There are two kinds of sheepfold that are, occurred in the ancient world. Uh, we call them sheep pen today. They were called sheepfolds. And, and it says that one was the village sheepfold, and that would be a place where everybody in the village would bring their sheep, and uh, there would be a gate on that sheepfold, that's what we call it. They called it a door back then, okay? It was the door to the, to the sheep fold. And uh, that would be the village one. Everybody would bring their sheep in together, and they put them in the pen, and then they'd have a watchman who would stand there and guard them over the night. And then the shepherds would come the next day and get their sheep. But now when the, the shepherds were out in the fields, if they didn't go back to the village, they had built these sheep folds that were out in the field. And there were just piles of rocks that made like a circular enclosure, Sometimes they were square or rectangular, but most of the time just circular in, in, in enclosure. And, and the, the door to the, there was no gate. They, they didn't take a carpenter out there and build a wooden gate and put it on there. Instead, the shepherd himself would lay across the entrance, and he himself would be the door to the sheepfold. And so we got this little background. And as we approach John chapter 10, which follows John chapter 9, that was probably the most profound statement I said all morning. Right? Chapter 10 follows chapter 9. All right. In chapter 9, he'd been talking to the Pharisees. And so it's no, when we come to chapter 10, when he says, you, he is referring to the Pharisees. So some Pharisees, it says in John chapter 9, verse 40, who were with him heard him saying what he was saying to the, the man that was born blind, that he had cured of his blindness so that he could see. And the, the Pharisees had thrown him out of the synagogue and Jesus reveals to him that he is the Messiah, and he believes in him and worships him. And he goes on and he says, and the Pharisees heard him that asked this, and they said, uh, what are we? Are we blind too? Jesus making a point. Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim to see, your guilt remains. You may physically see, but you were blind spiritually. The blind man couldn't see physically, but he had his sight restored, and he could also see, see, see spiritually. Based on this, he's talking to the Pharisees, basically saying, yes, you are blind. And it's followed up in the next passage. If we were to go a little bit before that, we, we see the testimony of the man where he said, yes, I believe that you are blind. The, uh, the Lord, the Messiah, my, my God. So Jesus in chapter 10 tells us a little story. It's a story that he's making a point. And as he tells the story, he said, I tell you the truth. The man who does not enter the sheep pen or the sheep fold by the gate or by the door, but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. Now, they're not getting this. But Jesus is saying, you guys are nothing but a bunch of thieves and robbers. You're trying to steal from the flock of God my sheep. So Jesus, in a roundabout way, is giving them a backhanded, not compliment, but a smackdown. He says, you're nothing but a bunch of thieves and robbers. I tell you the truth. He goes on and he says, the man who enters by the gate is the shepherd. So... Jesus says, I'm the shepherd. He's going to say that later. So he's the man who comes by the gate. So he comes to the flock of Israel. Okay, he's coming by the gate. He's the shepherd of the sheep. And the watchmen, 
the guy that's been staying there all night, okay, and watching the sheep, I believe that he's making a reference to John the Baptist. John the Baptist was the watchman, and he's going to turn over the flock of Israel, his followers, to Jesus. He let his own disciples go follow Jesus. He said, I must decrease and he must increase. And so John the Baptist is kind of pictured here as the watchman. The shepherd is Jesus. The watchman opens the gate for him, for the shepherd. And the sheep listen to his voice. See, the shepherds would come and the flocks would be all intermingled and he'd call his sheep by name and the sheep would hear his voice, recognize that voice. He'd come to the gate and he would follow he would follow the shepherd out. And so he said he'd hear his voice, he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. Now it says this, when he had brought out all of his own, he goes ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. I find it very interesting. God, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, speaks to us through the Bible, through his holy word. When a person comes to know Christ and they read the scriptures, it's like, aha, all of a sudden, this book makes sense to me. I hear his voice. I, I find people all the time that say, you know, I've read the Bible and it just doesn't make sense. They did not hear his voice. You have to be one of his sheep to recognize his voice. And that's what he's saying here. They recognize Jesus' voice. The blind man recognized his voice, and he had his sight restored. But you Pharisees don't hear my voice. He's telling this story. He says, the Pharisees missed it. Jesus used this figure of speech but they did not understand what he was telling them. They weren't his sheep. They were the robbers trying to take away the sheep. So to explain it, this is what Jesus says. He says, okay, I'm going to explain it to you. Here's the explanation. I am the door. Modern translations have it as the gate. I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. I'm the door. Jesus saying, you're not the door, Pharisees. I am the door. I am the door. Now, the word uh, thura is the Greek word for door. It's only in English that we translate it as gate because we feel that it is a pen, and a pen has a gate. Uh, like uh, uh, we have a, I hate to call it a pen, but we've got a fenced-in area behind the church that we pen in the kids, you know, uh, so that they don't escape when they're playing out there, okay? And, and so... And we, the door to it we call a gate. You see, that's the way it works. In the Greek New Testament, it's the same word door. So our tr modern translations are calling Jesus the gate, but the word really is he is the door. He's not just any kind of door. He says, I am the door. He says, I, I tell you the truth, I am the gate, I am the door. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers. There were many who were coming saying that they were the Christ. They are the Messiah. And uh, those were all thieves and robbers. And the sheep did not listen to them. Even the Pharisees are saying, we are the only way. Don't listen to this man. We know he's a sinner, but, but we follow Moses. And he's saying, listen, they are thieves and robbers. They are not the way. He said, I am the door, I'm the gate. Whoever enters through me, you see, there he is. He's lying in the gate like the field pen. He says, I am the gate. I am the door. He who enters through me, the entrance that leads, you go through me, and what that leads to, he says, is salvation. Whoever, whoever comes through me will be saved. Salvation has different tenses. I've been saved from my sins in the past. The moment I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior at eight years old, all my past sins were forgiven. Salvation has a present tense to it, though. When I trust in Jesus today, and I can trust in him, and he will save me from unnecessary sins in my life if I will just trust in him and not do it my own way. 
There is a future aspect to salvation in the sense that one day Jesus is going to come back for me and he's going to take me back to heaven or I'm going to die and go immediately to be with Christ and when I am, I will be saved from the very presence of sin. I'll never sin ever, ever again. Isn't that amazing? Whoever enters through me, the door, the gate, will be saved. He will be saved. Safe inside. Sometimes we call that eternally secure. I can never lose that. We saw that when we looked at the love of God just a few weeks past. I can never lose being the love object of God. The text goes on and says, listen, he, the sheep, will come in and go out. He'll come in to safety and he'll go out. And somebody says, whoa, does he lose his safety? No, 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 no. We know from Psalm 23. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Once I go into the fold, and then when he goes out, I'm with the Savior, he leads me. He, he, he's guiding me in the path. He's saying, this is the way. He has a shepherd's staff, right? And the shepherd's staff is to get that wandering sheep with the crook on the end, just gently grab it by the neck and pull it back in on the way. Sometimes he has to take a little hard jerk to pull us back in because we get a little stubborn, don't we? Don't we? I could tell you stubborn points in my life where I wandered from the Lord. And the Lord pretty much didn't use the staff. He took the rod and gave me a little club and said, boom, you better get back in the path on fire. See, he, he guides me in paths of righteousness. He does that through conviction. I'm convicted in my, I feel guilty when I do something wrong. He does that in gentle discipline, you know, like I would spank my child and say, listen, you're not going to do that. This is not the way the Hendersons behave. This is not the way God's people behave. And then sometimes he really wallops us upside the head. And I, sometimes I said, okay, Lord, it may be hard of hearing, but I'm not deaf. I got, the, I got the message. But he guides us. He's with us. Once you come into the fold of God, you're always in the fold of God. Wherever he goes, you go. And wherever he goes, he leads you. He leads you. He leads you. He's leading us, he says, to find pasture, satisfaction, he, he, he's going to lead us in, in the pasture so that we might feast on the lushness of God's blessing. I talk to people who don't know the Lord and share my faith with them. They, they'd like to have every, all the benefits, but they somehow think that if I become a Christian, I'm going to miss out on life. How mistaken they are. If you're not a Christian, you miss out on life. Because he leads us into green pastures so that we might have a satisfied, fulfilled, purpose-filled life. He gives that to us, satisfaction. In fact, in the Psalm 23, he says, He makes me lie down in green pastures. He makes me. I like that. He protects me. The thief comes only to, the, to uh, steal and to kill and destroy that's why the shepherd had not only a staff, but he had a rod or a club. The club was, hey, if a wolf comes along, I'm going to whack that. I'm going I'm to take him on in your behalf, the sheep. The shepherd looks out and cares for his sheep. He says, then, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. He guides me, he leads me, all right? He protects me. And he fulfills my life. It doesn't get much better than this. I would never trade my Christian life for the person who has no Savior. I've been to uh, funerals of those who are non-Christians. And they wail, they mourn, they weep, they cry. And I've been to funerals of those who are Christians. And they celebrate. Because the person has come to the end of life's journey and has gone on to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. <laughs> what a difference. I've come that they might have life and have it to the full. It's not just at the end of the journey, but all the way along the journey. But if I know that I have eternal life and, I'm, and the payoff in the end is I go to heaven, it makes my life here so much easier, so much more worry-free, so much more that the God who's going to save me and take me to heaven can certainly cover everything I need here and now. 
And the third, 23rd Psalm it says, my cup overflows. God just continues to bless me, bless me, and bless me. He goes on and he says, uh, not only am I the door, but I am the shepherd. I am the shepherd. What kind of shepherd? A good shepherd. I am a good shepherd. Now, most of us think on a scale, you know, sliding scale, you know, the grading on the curve. There are a lot of shepherds on earth, and they're okay, you know, maybe above average, and he's the good one. <laughs> That's not God's perspective. A rich man came to Jesus and uh, said to him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said, good teacher. That's why he started. Good teacher. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, why do you call me good? Are you, are you judging me on the curve? You, you just view me as better than other teachers? There's a lot of rabbis and I'm just a good one? He answered, no one. Jesus said, no one is good except God alone. Jesus is the good shepherd because he is God come in the flesh to lead us, to give us salvation. He is the good shepherd. This is God who came to earth to shepherd me and you. He said, I am the good shepherd who substitutes his life for ours. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. He's a substitute. Years ago, when I was a teenager, I, uh, our family was having a uh, Halloween party. All the uncles and aunts, and you know, they were having a family party. And I, I told my date at the time, I'd like to crash the party. So let's crash the party. We'll go in a costume. Nobody will recognize us. And so we went as two different you know, costumes, but mine was a pumpkin. We got a sheet. <laughs> And we uh, put it in the washing machine and dyed it orange. And I put some stripes on it. And, but I needed something, to, and I stuffed it with newspapers. I, I stitched it close around the bottom with a, a cardboard ring and around the top of my neck. And I, I'm in this, and it's, it's bulky. And, and I stuffed newspapers. But I needed something for the top, you know, to, to be the stem. Now, my mom baked wedding cakes for a living. She had a contract with a hall, and then she would... But that man, that, that cake box was just the perfect size. So I took her cake box and I spray painted it green to be the step on the top, painted it up and all. And, and so my, my mom found her box that she was going to deliver a cake in that day, all spray painted. And, and, and so, but we we're going to crash the party. And so I went to my brother Dave and I said, David, you got to do me a favor. You got to tell mom you painted it. <laughs> and you just say whatever reason. So he did. My mother, I, my mother was a wonder, godly woman. She lit into him. Oh my goodness. She railed on him. I thought, you know, we're way past the age of being spanked. And I thought for sure she's going to spank my brother. And she was just laying into him afterwards. I said, oh, thank you, Dave. Thank you, man. I mean, he got it. So we go to the party. I'm this big pumpkin. I can hardly get down the stairs because I'm squishing on both sides. And I got this head on. I'm, I'm wearing boots, so you can't tell, you know, my skinny legs. And I'm wearing these boots. I got this big pumpkin, got the head on. My mom is sure, and she comes over and she says, David, now I know what you did with my, <laughs> with, with my cake box. And she is, she's still laying into my, only it's me now. She's just laying into me but calling me David. Well, then it came time to take them all off. And I took that off. My mom was so shocked. She had been railing on the wrong person. My brother was my substitute. He took the fury and wrath of my mother in my place. That's what he did. The scenario here is much different. Jesus had the sin of the world laid on him. He had your sin, my sin. It was put on him and the wrath of Almighty God was poured out on him. Listen, that's what he says. The good shepherd, the one come from above, God, came down, assumed our humanity, and he laid down his life for the sheep. That's for you and me. He was our substitute. He took our place. You see, he owns the sheep. Jesus bought us with his blood. 
when he was on the cross, and we're going to see this as we hit Holy Week, Jesus was on the cross, he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And he, and he, he says all the seven sayings, and he gets down to the, to the end, and he cries out, It is finished! Paid in full! Is what the Greek word tetelestai means. He purchased us with his own blood, and we belong to him. Now listen, he says, the hired hand, that's you Pharisees, you don't know the Lord. You think you're righteous and pious, and you're self-righteous, and you, you, you think you're a bunch of do-gooders, you think that's good enough. He says, and you're trying to steal the sheep of God from my flock. He says, the hired hand, you guys, is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons his sheep and runs away. Anytime there's any real difficulty, he'll, he'll turn on you in a heartbeat. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away. Why? Because he's a hired hand. He doesn't own the sheep, and he doesn't care for the sheep. You see, the good shepherd cares for the sheep. I'm here to tell you today, Jesus cares about you. You know, every now and then a sheep gets lost, starts meandering off from the crowd. It's out, out in green pastures. It's nibbling its way, and it's nibbling here and there, and pretty soon it looks up, no sheep around. It's gone astray. Shepherd takes them back to the fold and puts them in the pen and realizes he's counting them as they go in, and all of a sudden, no, this is, you're missing. You're missing. So he leaves the 90 and 9 in the fold. And he goes out and he hunts and he tracks you down because he cares about you. The shepherd, the, shepherd, the true shepherd, the good shepherd, he cares for you. But the hired hand, he didn't care one bit about you. Jesus cares about you. It says, he knows us. The good shepherd knows his sheep. I am the good shepherd, he says. I know my sheep. And he says, my sheep know me. Jesus knows you. He knows you better than you. You know yourself. The question is, do you know him? Do you know him? He says, I know my sheep, and my sheep know me, just as I, or just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father and he says again, I lay my life down for the sheep. I find this very interesting. First he says, the good shepherd lays himself down for the sheep. Third person, the, third, the, the, the good shepherd, he does. Now he shifts that to say, because I am the good shepherd, I lay my life down for the sheep. I lay them, my life down. Do you remember in the garden, you know, Jesus had been in the garden of Gethsemane and he was praying, told the disciples, pray with me, and they didn't. They fell asleep. He comes, wakes them up. Come on, pray with me. He goes back and prays. And Jesus is praying great drops of like blood. And, and he's praying. He's very intense in prayer. And, and then he gets up and, and it's time. And here comes Judas with torches and, and uh, uh, <clears throat> they're come for Jesus. And, and Jesus says, uh, whom seek ye? So they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And then the next words are so powerful. Jesus said, I am he. Soon as he said that, all of the soldiers fell back to the ground. You don't come and see God Almighty come in the flesh. They get all back up. Peter, you know, whips out his sword, chops off the ear of Malchus, the high priest's servant. Jesus heals it. He said, whom seek ye? Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus voluntarily goes with the temple guard to be abused all night in false trials, false accusations, and be led to the cross. And he lays down his life for the sheep. Why? Because on the cross, he pays in full the debt we owe. He saves the sheep. He says, I have other sheep 
You see, he is so inclusive, so inclusive. I have other sheep, not just you Jews here, the Jewish sheep, but I have some others. You consider them black sheep. They don't belong in the fold, but they're Gentiles. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I have more. They're going to come to me. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and they shall be one flock and one shepherd. You see, in Ephesians, it tells us in the body of Christ, there's neither Jew nor Gentile. There's no bond nor free. We are all one in Christ. In the body of Christ, he takes from Jewish people, and they get saved, like the, like the, the apostles. They were all Jewish. He brings Gentiles in, and he makes us all one flock. We are the church of God. It is all inclusive. You're here today, and he wants to be your shepherd too, even if you don't know him. He wants you to... He wants you to be in his flock. You must come to him. Confess that he is the Christ, the son of the living God. He is the good shepherd. You, you, you confess him, and he will include you in his flock because if you hear his voice calling and you respond, you will be part of that one flock, and he will be your one shepherd. He goes on and says, The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life. Not only do I uh, take it up again, I mean, only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the power to lay it down. Jesus laid down his life. When Jesus uh, voluntarily laid on that cross, because they couldn't force him on that cross, he voluntarily laid on that cross, and he extended his arms out on each, each, each of the beams, and they picked up the nails and they drove them in his hand. The text seems to be saying, while they were crucifying him, while it was going on, he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. In the very act. I think the one thief that repented on the cross was probably re reflecting on the fact that this man did not do like we did when they nailed us. We cursed those guys. <laughs> But he prayed for them instead. Something changed his attitude. You see, he saw that there was something different about Jesus. He laid down his life. Later in John chapter 15, Jesus is going to say to the disciples, Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. You are my friends if you do whatsoever I have commanded you. What has he been commanding? Believe and follow me. Believe and follow me. He's saying, believe in me that I'm the Son of God. Confess me, but follow me. And it's not going to be an easy road. You're going to have to take up your cross and follow me. Follow me. Follow me. He says, I have the authority to lay my life down. There's a song that's based on the scripture that he could have called 10,000 angels. He could end it right there. So, whoa, what are you? As soon as they start to put that nail, whoa, hold a bit. Gabriel, hey, you know, and he started naming them all. Come on. Everything would have been different. But he voluntarily laid himself down. He said, not only do I have the authority to lay it down, but I also have the authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. I voluntarily, substitutionarily, laid it down, but I also had the authority then to take it up again. There's a reason why. In Romans chapter 4, verse 25, it says, He was delivered over to death for our sins. I voluntarily laid it down to pay in full the price of your sin. And I was, and he was, Jesus, was raised again to life for our justification. What he is saying here is, if Jesus hadn't accomplished our salvation... He would have remained in the grave, but God raised him up because he did what, he, what needed to be done, the payment in full for our sins. He was raised to life so that he could justify us that we might have eternal life. Is this powerful? This is great. This is what I want you to take with you today. Some of you might have this already memorized, but I want you to take it with you today. It is the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. 
I shall not be in want. I'm glad the new modern translations put the word be in there because when I was a child, it just read, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And I told you that I refused to memorize this, this psalm because I wanted him as my shepherd. It sounded to me like the Lord is my shepherd. I don't want him. No, but I wanted him. It's a syllogism. The Lord is my shepherd. The part that's missing here is good shepherds take good care of their sheep. Therefore, I shall never be in want. Does that make sense? That is the statement at the beginning. The rest of the psalm is the support of that syllogism, that logical equation that he made there. The Lord is my shepherd. That equals I'll never ever be in want. Here's the proof. He, third person, the Lord, makes me lie down in green pastures. He, the Lord, leads me beside quiet waters. He, the Lord, restores my soul. He, the Lord, guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Everything shifts at this point. From he, the Lord, now to me, the I, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I got it tough here in life. And as I'm walking through the difficulties and death is casting its shadow over in my path and, and, and things look gloom and doom, I will fear no evil. Now he turns, not from the third person or the first person, to the second person. And he addresses God as, for you are with me. Your rod that you used to beat off the wolves and anything that would attack, your rod and your staff, for when I wander away, you pull me back. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. They comfort me. You actually prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. My enemies have me surrounded. Difficulties of life, financial, physical, you name it, whatever it is, relational, all these difficulties. And there you set a table before me and the two of us, we share a meal and I'm at peace and I have fellowship with you, God, and you speak to my heart and I am so comforted even though my world's a mess. Wow. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies and you anoint my head with oil. The oil was used in two ways ceremonial, actually kind of three, ceremonial to anoint like a priest or a king to an office and a mission. It's used medicinally. You would use it to bind up and fill in a wound and you would use it like medicine. It was also you just kind of cleansing. You would kind of cleanse with it. You anoint my head with oil. You, you minister to me when all of this is surrounding me, you, you give me a table, you feed me, we have fellowship, conversation, and you enrich my life with oil so that my cup is overflowing. I have abundance from you, Lord. I have more than I really need. Most of us think we need more than we really have. But I have more than I really need. You've done this, Lord. Then he says, surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. You got the expression from the cradle to the grave. <laughs> I found a cradle that is a grave. Goodness and love will follow me. I, I like to think of it as like a boat. And, and you're in the boat and you look behind and there's a wake that follows you. All that was there, all that water that was in that wake was in front of you at one point. But you didn't see it as a wake until you passed through it. What he's saying here is, surely goodness and love. When I look behind me, where I have been, you will see that surely goodness and love was with you every step of the way. Do you see it as you're going in the front? No, you don't see it in the front. It's only when you look back. The Bible says where we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. You know when they look good? When you look back and you see them in the past. How do they look in the future? Gloom and doom. Gloom and doom. But when you look back, saying, listen, my whole life, Psalm, 
the shepherd's been leading and guiding me. There's been all the, you know, the valley of the shadow of death, the look gloom and doom. But, but when I look back, the whole way it's been goodness and love of God in my life. And then he adds these words, and I love it, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. At the end of the journey, I'm going to take the ride to, to the sky. I'm going to be with the Lord forever and ever in the house of the Lord. How do you see Jesus? Jesus saw himself as the shepherd and the door. How do you see Jesus? Do you see him as your shepherd and door? He can be the door and the shepherd if you receive him as your Savior and Lord. He is the door. That's what Jesus said, I am the door. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're so very thankful for the metaphor that Jesus used to express who he is. He's the entrance door to salvation, sanctification, glorification, all that we could possibly ever have, all the blessings of heaven and blessings on earth too. He is a shepherd who cares for us. He died for us. He rose for us. And he wants to guide and deliver us and lead us and every day. Lord, I pray, if someone here does not have Jesus as their Savior, but they heard his voice today and said, come, follow me, that right now they'd say, Lord, count me in, save me. I want to follow you. I want to be included in the flock of God. We know that you will. They will hear your voice in the word. They will hear you speak to them. They will know that they are yours and, and you, you are theirs. Lord, as we approach the Lord's Supper table, we pray that as we look at this memorial service, we'll reflect upon what we've just heard and realize that these elements are all about remembering what Jesus did for us. Bless us now in this time, in Christ's name, amen.